All right, uh, calling the September 16th meeting to order. It is 6.29 p.m. So welcome to the September 16th, 2024 meeting of the Library Commission. This is a hybrid meeting with commissioners, city staff, and members of the public participating in person at the Menlo Park Library in accordance with public health guidelines for in-person meetings and the public participating remotely. Commissioners present include Kim Crockett, Michael Herrick, David Pollock, Scott Schaefer, Brian Westcott, and myself, Jennifer Wise. City staff uh, present include Library and Community Services Director Sean Reinhart, Assistant Library and Community Services Director Nick Shegda, um, LCS Supervisor Rose Waldman, Librarian Nora Mercer, Librarian David Jimenez, and Senior Program Specialist John Weaver. Nick will be helping facilitate the meeting. Nick, will you please take a moment and provide instructions to the commission and members of the public in attendance and how the meeting will proceed. Thank you, Vice Chair. For members of the public for attending this meeting virtually and wish to provide public comment, after the chair calls for public comment on the item you wish to speak on, please use that raise hand feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. For those who are calling in from a landline or cell phone, please press star nine to raise your virtual hand. Members of the public attending remotely uh, may who wish to speak, please take a moment to make sure your first and last name are updated on Zoom, or you may provide your name and the spelling as you are called to speak. Public comment will be heard in the order received, and it's limited to three minutes in length. For members of the public attending in person, there are speaker cards in the table back behind me there, and please fill one out and turn it in to me uh, or another staff member here before public comment is called to the item you wish to speak on. If there are a large number of public commenters, the time limit may be adjusted by the chair of the meeting in order to allow everyone a chance to comment. When your turn for online public comment has arrived, staff will unmute you. And with that, I'll return the meeting to the vice chair. Great. So under public comment, the public may address the commission on any subject not listed on the agenda. Each speaker may address the commission once under public comment for a limit of three minutes. You are not required to provide your name or city of residence, but it is helpful. The commission cannot act on items not listed on the agenda, and therefore the commission cannot respond to non-agenda issues brought up under public comment other than to provide general information. So do we have any public comment on items not appearing on the agenda? At this time, if you'd like to make a public comment on an item not on the, on the agenda for this evening, Please notify us by using that raise hand feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. If you're dialing in, you can use star nine to engage the raise hand function. Also, there are comment cards there in the back. Pausing to see no online attendees oh. and no one looking for public comment <laughs> here. So with that, back to the vice chair. Okay, well, we begin tonight with a library overview presentation from the library team. After the presentation, we will take public comment and then have time for the commission to discuss. Assistant Director Nick Shegda will begin the presentation. Thank you very much, Vice Chair. I'm going to start sharing my screen here. Fortunately, when I copied it over to uh, PDF, it put in a horrible white transition between each slide. I apologize <laughs> in advance in advance for that. Um, so this is a series of programs that we uh, talked with the commission about. It sort of arose out of um, the discussions uh, the commission was having about their work plan for the year. Um, so that's my intro spiel and I will pass it over to uh, Supervisor Rose Walsh. Hello. Hello. Right. right. So uh, this is the first in a series, as you can see, of six presentations that we have planned for the next year. Uh, today is library overview, who we are and what we do. Um, as you can see on the slide what our, uh, our, our list of upcoming attractions is. Um, these, I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and put this bottle of water right there. If anybody's thirsty, there's a bottle of water. <laughs> uh, uh, 
all of these topics were brought up during your June meeting where you were talking about your work plan. I was hovering over in the corner. Um, and these are the six topics that came up and that I thought, well, that's something that staff could speak to. Um, so that's sort of the inspiration for this series. Thank you for that inspiration. It's all very helpful. Uh, and uh, so, so I'm going to encourage uh, my staff members here. So part part of this is so that you get to meet the staff. Um, and so, so I've got I've got everyone on a rota. You'll be meeting everyone, all, all of our benefited staff members over the course of these presentations. Uh, the names the names were called out at the beginning. So just just to introduce everyone. Uh, we have librarian David Jimenez and, and librarian Nora Mercer, who some of you have met before, and senior program assistant Donna Weaver. Um, and uh, these are key members of the team. Uh, I chose uh, our team members who are going to be speaking to you on these topics partially based on their uh, subject specialties and skill sets, um, and partially based on, well, Better talk about something. <laughs> so, uh, with that, I, I am going to encourage. While while we do sort of have assignments over the course of this presentation for you, um, I'm I'm encouraging staff to jump in and add uh, because I think that this will be more helpful and informative if it's more like a conversation between us. Uh, and so, with that, I'm going to ask them all to. Stand up here all together. <laughs> um, thank you. Uh, all right, so I'm first. Um, uh, the first thing that I'd like to draw your attention to is um, this this quote on the side here, which is a little trite, but also is very true. Um, it's this. This is a quote by R. David Lanks. Um, I strongly recommend the Atlas of New Librarianship uh, for anyone who is interested in what librarianship looks like in the modern day. Um, it is an open source document. You can get a printed copy of it if you really want to, but it's open source, it's online. It's a little heady in the sense of he really it gets into information science. I have not read the whole thing. I, I fully acknowledge that, but I'm I'm going to um, because it is it's 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 a it's a book about librarianship by a librarian um, and and sort of about the concept of librarianship. And what this says is a room full of books is simply a closet, but an empty room with librarian in it is a library, and that's that's sort of where I'm coming from with this, who we are. So our staff members uh, keep our doors open seven days a week, eight hours a day. Um, we have a diverse group of multi-talented staff members who have different skill sets and backgrounds. Um, uh, in terms of the way that our library is structured, we have librarians and library assistants at our library. Uh, other public libraries often have classifications that are below library assistant. Um, we don't. That was a very intentional choice on Sean's part um, to try and offer a living wage in the Bay Area. Uh, so we, we hold our staff to a very high standard because we only hire at the highest classifications that are available in public libraries. Uh, we have our benefited staff members who work 40 hours a week. We have one 20 hour a week staff member, and we've also got hourly staff members uh, who are max 18 hours a week. Uh, this team provides empathetic, knowledgeable, equitable customer service at our public facing desks. Uh, they provide kids with safe interactions with adults who aren't teachers or guardians. Uh, they provide reading suggestions and advice. They give answers to questions from the easily Googleable to the extraordinarily esoteric. Um, and they provide technology assistance of all kinds. Uh, they also make sure that our uh, community has access, the most direct possible access to 
books, DVDs, magazines, all the other materials that we provide by making sure that what's in the online catalog reflects what's actually on the shelves, making sure that the items that are on the shelves are relevant and up to date and in demand and clean and <laughs> clearly labeled. Um, and making sure that the materials are where they are supposed to be so that they can be found when they are needed. Uh, our staff provide a variety of worldview and perspective through the materials that we acquire and choose to highlight in our book displays, our special collections, our programming. And we offer assistance accessing the materials um, through a variety of online resources as well as in person. We've developed a modular training program that ensures that all of our staff, both new and continuing, are prepared to execute this work because our community places a great deal of trust in us. Uh, that's the, well, it's one of the reasons that we hold our staff to a very high standard because we have a duty of care toward the public. We are granted stewardship of government funds and resources and the public tends to put a great deal of trust in libraries and librarians. Uh, if, you, if you go online and Google New Research Center Libraries, uh, you will find that, well, most of the information that comes up when you do that search is from between 2016 and 2018. There's a, a lot of information about how the public trusts libraries. They trust us to provide accurate information. They trust us to provide equitable information. So that is who we are, a little bit of what we do, but I'm going to yield the floor a little bit. Today. I'm going to go fast because Please you guys sorry. you guys hear me talk all the time and these guys have more interesting slides than I do. <laughs> this is a this is a very high level. I guess you could call this sort of our thesis statement. Um, that sentence there about providing equitable access to information, and that also includes resources, programs, and our physical facilities. And we do all that so that our community can enrich their quality of life um, through literacy of all sorts and through interpersonal connection, through building community. Um, and how we carry out that thesis statement are those three bullet points and I will turn to our next presenter to tell us about one of them. And that is Nora, you are up. Hello. I'm here talking about lifelong learning, which is sort of an industry term that doesn't really have a specific definition, but it is, I look. <laughs> um, but it is sort of based on the idea that we are always learning at every point in our life. Um, and so lifelong learning is generally the act of ongoing self-motivated learning at any age for either professional or uh, personal benefit. And the library supports lifelong learning through access to some of the following things, which is broken down on that beautiful chart. <laughs> to, uh, sort of different sections, uh, what you would traditionally find in a library, what you would expect to find in any public library in America that you walk into, which is books in a variety of formats, including regular books, large type books, graphic novels, books on CDs, as well as music CDs and DVDs. <laughs> books in languages other than English as well. Um, and well, as well as things that you would expect to find in a library in the 21st century, which is online resources, digital resources like ebooks and digital audiobooks, online databases for streaming music and movies, academic research, language learning, financial literacy, job skills, all kinds of different things, as well as access to technology. Uh, we actually offer access to computers and Wi-Fi, both in the library and to take home. We have laptops for in-library use. There's free Wi-Fi everywhere in the building. We also have Wi-Fi hotspots and frontal laptops that we loan out for seven days to see Michael Park residents. We've also built some special collections 
specifically tailored to our community. We have a big Spanish language collection. We also have a new local author collection. We also have a BIPOC voices collection highlighting the experiences of yes. black and indigenous people of color, <laughs> as well as things that aren't traditional books. Uh, we have read together kits to help encourage early literacy in young children. We have pickleball sets, we have board games and video games and parks passes to get people out and moving in the community as well, because those are ways to learn as well. And of course, our staff are a resource that can help in lifelong learning in helping people access and know how to use some of these resources and our programs, which is John will talk about a little bit later. All right. And with yeah. that, I will pass it on. And if you're interested in, th thank you, thank okay. you, Nora, for 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 covering some of the things that I left off of that chart. Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, but also, if you are interested in finding out more about our streaming music platform, for example, our various different online resources, for one thing, you can ask Nora. With our e resources library. Uh, but you can also, uh, you can find all this online at slash library. Uh, I specifically, the online, online resource, resource slash online resources. Thank you. Thank you. All right, everybody. So, I'm going to talk a little bit about how libraries are in an open and inclusive space. Going to do this by talking about how we are welcoming some of the things we do to be inclusive, our accessibility, as well as some of the social services that we provide. Um, firstly, we believe that libraries are for everyone. We want the public to want to come in. And so, one way we do that is by having comfortable spaces. Uh, we have spaces that are tailored to people of different age groups. We have our children's area, our teens' area, and our adult area. Each of these areas is Uniquely furnished as a curated collection to appeal to that demographic. Uh, my favorite example of this is the children's area. It has a lot of open space for parents and children to play, lots of bright colors. They have board books so toddlers can chew on them. <laughs> um, and we also have staff who are knowledgeable of the library systems and who are eager to help. Um, they want you to ask that tough question so they can find the answer for you. Um, next up, inclusivity. Uh, the library emphasizes inclusivity and we promote, promote cultural sharing across our events, our collection, and our staff. Um, for example, uh, this month uh, just kicked off with Latino Heritage Month, and we just had a couple of events uh, celebrating that. We had a mariachi band come in, and then we had a papel picado event, and I think that's a place where I was just going yes, to. So, yeah, awesome. So uh, just a quick little example of that. Uh, we also make sure that our collection is reflective of different world experiences. Uh, as Nora mentioned, we do have our BB collection, the BIPOC collection, that um, highlights BIPOC authors and characters, and that's one collection that does that. We also do this in our general stacks as well. Make sure to incorporate it everywhere that we can. And um, then we have our staff who come from all types of backgrounds who speak different languages, help people feel more comfortable uh, when they need help with them. And I, on to accessibility. Uh, everything at the library is free. When you come in, you can start using stuff right away. You can use our Wi-Fi, you can use our outlets. Uh, if you sign up for a library card, you can use a little bit more and check out books, uh, use our e-resources. And signing up for a library card itself is very accessible. It's a quick and free process um, uh, that anybody can do. Uh, and we can, we're uh, happy to help anyone who's help with that. Uh, we're also ADA compliant. For example, we have uh, three feet of space between our bookshelves to make the space easily navigable. I practiced saying that word. Uh, <laughs> <for> <laughs> users. <laughs> and we also have various mediums um, that learners can choose from that best suits their learning style. Uh, we have audio, traditional text, uh, visual resources to help with that. And uh, lastly, the library provides a uh, kind of social services. Uh, we are a place you can come to to 
stay warm when it's cold out, stay cool when it's warm out, stay dry when it's wet out. Uh, you can come, you can exist here, no one's gonna bother you or hassle you, it doesn't matter who you are. Um, and we also have, as Nora mentioned, uh, uh, quite a few like, e resources or electronics that we offer, like our hotspots and our Wi Fi, our laptops. This is our part in trying to mitigate the digital divide as best we can. And um, of course, we also help people connect to uh, resources as they need them, uh, whether this be something uh, easy and you know not too difficult, or maybe something that's a little more dire and finding shelter or their next meal. That's something that we're going to. Uh, help someone find the next steps for. And I believe Nick actually had a somewhat recent example. Well, that was a very nice toss there, David. Thank you. <laughs> um, I'm not often out on the public desks anymore, but I was probably three weeks ago. I got called out by one of the um, hourly staff who uh, to assist a customer who wanted help with. Um, um, resources about studying for um, uh, citizenship exam. So seems pretty straightforward, but uh, as it often happens when you're talking to someone who's looking for something, they might start with one thing, but go to something else that they need. And this gentleman actually needed help with kind of a lot of things. He was, um, English was not his first language. Um, he was uh, he was a senior and he wanted help with food services, with um, sort of connecting with other seniors, um, as well as um, you know more sort of what we would consider social services. So we're we are not librarians; they're not trained as social workers mm -hmm. or as mental health professionals. Mm -hmm. However, we tend to do a, a fair bit of triaging mm -hmm. and assisting people with those issues. So I was able to help this gentleman kind of get a, a package of stuff that he could go and and look at and also have um, more more things to, to find more resources. But I also, which is something that we all do here, is provide um, assistance if they get stuck, if someone, so it's not just giving them a, a giant list of things going, here you go, buddy. Mm -hmm. um, you, you sort of walk people through things, you show them how you're finding things so they might learn how to do that, but also you give them an out if they get stuck, that they could come back and get more assistance. Cool. Thank you. Sure. That's, that is a, a lovely example of the way that we act as a social service. Our mandate is to provide access to information. Um, and a lot of the time that access to information is helping people figure out what, what they're looking for. For, and also, we do, we connect people with immediate needs. And as Nick was intimating, we are also often, because we are a safe, warm, dry place to be on the front lines of dealing with things that we are not necessarily equipped to deal with. Because if the social service isn't in place and someone's having a mental health crisis, you're open. Mm -hmm. All right. Moving, moving right on. Hello, my name is John Weaver. I work with the programs at the library. And as some of my colleagues have said, uh, the library is all about access and resources and learning for all different people. And um, our library programs, they enhance all of those other uh, opportunities we have. We enhance and promote our collection through direct experience. So, um, people can meet subject experts, they can learn a new thing, um, and it, they help the library be that third place, not the home, not the workplace, but that other place where people can go and learn and feel comfortable, and they don't have to spend any money, which is a big thing about what we do here. Uh, we provide for different learning styles. Uh, you know, some people do best by reading, some people do best by hearing, and we have subject experts come in, we have hands-on experiences, and so there are a number of ways that people can get an experience at the library. They've got the electronic resources, they've got the physical resources, and we supplement them all with the various programs we provide at different points throughout the year. Uh, let's see. We have story times, book groups, we have English language learning, garden talks, performance, hands-on experiences in the arts. So if a person is not a visual learner, as far as reading, 
that they need to see something happen in front of them, it can happen that way. If, if your English language skills are not the best, uh, sometimes it's best to see a thing happen that way. So it, it gives people a number of different ways, surprising to them in some cases, that they even have anything beyond say a story time at a library. It's an extra opportunity for learning. It sparks imagination, it sparks creativity, and there is no need to spend money at the library. We're gonna be talking more about all of the things that we've touched upon over upcoming months. Um, what I love about programming at the library is it makes all of our um, our, our things that we offer a, a two-way experience. You can read about things and wonder, well, I'd like to know more about this so we can have an expert at the library come and talk about it. Or you could come to the library just for the program and we can say to you, oh, well, we've got a book on that. We've got an online resource for you because we all have our hands in the programming and the things that are associated with it. So when there's a program coming up at the library, you can check out the book displays that my colleagues have made and you see some of the resources and some lists of other resources where you can learn more about what we have. And you can go up to our help desk and you can get um, guided to some of the online resources that we have. So it makes the library a real 3D experience to have the programming as well as the materials. Thank you. Thank you, and, and in addition to that, the library being a place for the community to gather, we do see independent groups coming together. We have our chess players who come and we built our board game collection based on the fact that we saw chess players coming to play chess. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, we we had, Nora does lead a D and B group for teams, but we've also got other D and B teams who come in to the team zone and play on their own, which is don't tell them, but adorable. <laughs> <laughs> uh, people come in, they co-work, they tutor here. Um, it's it's a place to meet your neighbors with similar interests, and we do develop our collections, as I've sort of alluded to, around what the residents want, what the demand is. So, um, that's, 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 it. that's the end of our presentation on a library overview. Anyone have any questions for any of that? I had a question, and I hope it's not too detailed, but yeah, I'm interested in the social mm -hmm. services. Is that something that is involved or has, is that really been planned or are you just kind of picking up the slack because Nick, sorry, it's just uh, I, I'm sorry it's just sort of a um, yeah a businessy thing okay. we should probably take public comment okay, okay. we start okay. having well, the, we will the discussion get right back to the great okay. discussion so, <laughs> so Nick do we have any public comment on this and Nick will jump back in <laughs> this time if you'd like to make a public comment about the presentation library overview Use that raise hand function at the bottom of your Zoom screen, dialing in, press star nine. We'll fill out a speaker card back behind me and bring it up. Pausing. No public comment. Okay. So, uh, okay. so the question yeah. was social services. <laughs> social is that a new thing or is that something we've done all along? And, and how is it evolved? Um, mm -hmm. Because I, you know, because the library is, as you've outlined, such an accessible place. It right. seems to be a place where people in need might feel the most comfortable. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I, I'm just wondering if it's yes. kind of well. The the answer is yes, and mm -hmm. uh, our purpose as an information providing organization. That's that is our our service socially, and mm -hmm. and we as as long as well not as long as there have been public libraries because the publicness of a public library if you look into library histories is a complicated thing, mm -hmm. uh, but as long as there have been public libraries the way we think of them, uh, yes, it's a place where people can come to find the information that they need, and that's the that is a social service. Now, I think that you're asking more specifically about the mental health services aspect of things. You know, I think that to, to some extent, there has always been, you know, this is a safe place mm -hmm. where there are rules about engagement and, and everybody can coexist. Um, I also think that if you look at what else is going on, 
that will inform how much we end up shouldering that burden. Right. If, if if that makes sense. yeah, no, that's exactly what. Um, so. And we we partner with various organizations. Um, uh, what's Mateo? I keep forgetting the name. New name of Mateo Lodge. Oh, um, stop! Is it Star Vista? No, um, that's different. No, we hope. Is it we hope? There are there are a number of there are a number of social service and, and mental health, and we have agencies. many many lists of these agencies. Um, you know the. There are, you know, some libraries that partner with um, health, the, with a health mm -hmm. department. You know, San Francisco brings right. PASAs in, and that is a very necessary service at the main library in San Francisco and the Tenderloin. Um, so, so you know, I think different libraries respond differently to this need, um, but it is, it is certainly. It's certainly something that all of us deal with on a very regular basis. Would it would it be fair to say that it's a necessary part and the demand might be growing and it should be acknowledged, not not just let you know kind of evolve. I'm always hesitant to say that anything that something is growing without sass. Right. <laughs> Uh, I would I would want to look into the statistics and whatever we could find, um, but but I absolutely feel just from experiential mm -hmm. lived experience right. of those of us who are on desk. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's not something that can be overlooked. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. Does anyone else have any other questions about the library overview? So uh, I, uh, following up on this question to some extent, um, I just maybe more of a a comment more than a question, but anyway, um, so I myself during the summer um, visited the library to understand what was the situation with um, uh, cooling centers uh, during the heat wave, and the person at the front desk was very helpful. But I something that I immediately we discovered together that all of the cooling and heating centers are based on the criteria that's already in place for that facility. In that, um, pets are not allowed. It, at the library when even when it's used as a cooling center and the only cooling center that uh, is nearby is the San Mateo County Library at North Fair Oaks, which happens to be sort of, you know, co-housed with the uh, homeless shelter and other uh, county services next door. Uh, it's, it's actually in the same, um, the entrance is the same for county services or going to the, the library. Um, and so that's the only place that a, that pets are allowed in the cooling center. And I uh, raised the issue with the um, uh, emergency response um, manager in San Mateo. And they said, yeah, that's, uh, kind of how it is, and it's something you might want to think about in the future. Um, you know, I, it, you know, it is understandable where you need to draw the line and the protocols and the and the process. But in the future, if things get really bad uh, for heat or cold, it might be uh, helpful to look into changing adjusting the rules so that people can bring their well-behaved mm -hmm. <laughs> pets however you define that uh in an emergency so we situation. have an emergency operations not committee for the city mm -hmm. um and i'm sure that at such time as such extremes came up that would be mm -hmm. something to be discussed there yeah i i raised it with the um 
city staff who was staffing that committee mm -hmm. and said he would raise that. So I just um, thought I'd just right. share that uh, with you. Uh, the other, I'm rather confused of, so my understanding of uh, a definition of a library in a traditional sense is what you seem to be referring to as collections and mm -hmm. the, the books and the CDs and the digital uh, access to digital resources mm -hmm. uh, online. Uh, but then sort of separately, a, se or a separate category is programs. And so I like I put in like the upcoming music with uh, Panaderos. Panaderos. Panaderos, thank you. Uh, the celebration of, I don't know, the uh, uh, Persian um, uh, uh, what is it, like, harvest festival or um, such and such New Year's or chess, you know, uh, folks getting together with uh, playing chess or or such and I and I, I love all of these mm -hmm. community building connecting you know with the cultural heritage of the community but um how is that like generally defined and you know sort of managed well, in the long term I'm so glad that you're asking um that's exactly what I was hoping to highlight with this presentation is that it's all the library. The collection, like Lank said, you can have a bunch of books in a room and it's a closet. If you mm -hmm. have the professionals, if you have many different experiences, if you're highlighting a sharing of cultures, that's all the library. That's all our thing. And is there someone in particular who is responsible for the programs or and so you would yes but, but we all provide programming mm -hmm. uh, david leads our conversation our english language conversation club nora and i lead a science fiction and fantasy book group together mm -hmm. as well as nora leads our B &D, our team D, D group you know we all do pitch in and create programming uh john's responsibility has to do largely with making sure that we have the outside experts coming in and doing everything that he was talking about and uh, what they think. Yeah, it's, a, it's an organization-wide conversation, I would say. And we will be talking about programs more in November. And, and a presentation. Yeah, yeah. Yes, that yeah. is our next That's topic. the focus oh, on, okay. on the November presentation will be on library program. Oh, okay. Well, thank you. Anything else? Yes. Um, so I was just curious, you know, you talked quite a bit about the wide variety of services that the library provides, and I'm just curious how the library determines when new services need to be added, how you test out new services, um, just what that process looks like. Great question. I, I, I feel like I've been holding forth, so if you want to talk, it's please. a great question <laughs> and it's a complicated answer because I yes. think it depends on a lot of factors. Mm -hmm. Um, there is, of course, community demand. If we get, we have, of course, a suggestion feature on our website where people can suggest mostly books and suggestion box. And suggestion box, <laughs> they suggest mostly books and things like that, but they could put in the suggestion box that I want a program or mm -hmm. something. That's or I would like, uh, and they do, they do. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, the database right. that I forgot right. from right. NPR or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you try to this magazine? Um, so partly it's that, and partly it's us looking at our collection and saying, is there a gap here? Mm -hmm. um, if somebody were to come in and ask for information about a specific thing, do we have that? Mm -hmm. um, at all, do we have right. a book? Do we have a database? Do we have anything? Um, and so we look at sort of a lot of different factors to decide what to add to the collection in that regard. Right. And then 
we would go out and look for what is available right. and what we can afford. What we can afford. <laughs> and then usually I reach out to a database and look at how much does it cost? What does the access look like? And get a demo and I see what the types of content on the database is, right? And then make a decision based on that. Basically, there's there's proactive and reactive. Mm -hmm. Uh there's, you know, we we do we when we were good, Collecting for the the Bellhaven Community Campus, we put out a survey. We we made the effort, and we are we still we are we are seeking input from the community. We are always seeking input from the community. We also, you know, it is our professional job to do the work ahead of time. See what's being published. See what's hot. Keep an eye on the news. Keep an eye on what is what people are wanting to discourse about. So, thank you. And then I would say on the back end of that, seeing what people, what's in our collection that people are no longer oh, yeah, borrowing, that's a big part of are it. no longer interested in. That's uh, something that's not. And what's no longer up to date? Up to date. What's no, mm -hmm. That's that's. Or, you know, or making sure the accurate. collection is fresh is important, especially with nonfiction. Yes. Yeah. Uh, along those same lines, I was just wondering, curious about how much you might collaborate with peer libraries or those maybe even not uh, next door to us, but maybe in other parts of California or even other parts of the country, if you ever do that, um, just to kind of, you know, leverage their experience. Oh, yeah, we do that to an extent. A number of our electronic resources are actually, uh, we get through the Peninsula Library system mm -hmm. and a number of them we get our we get from the state library yes uh we're also a member of an interlibrary loan mm -hmm. system that is california wide all the libraries that have decided to join it so you can get books from la mm -hmm. or yeah san diego yes. or Sacramento. also don't have them we make sure that we provide uh opportunities for our librarians to talk to other librarians uh, in the form of going to conferences, I, mm. I was able to go to the, the the Public Library Association conference earlier this year. Uh, Nora went to the American Library Association conference. John is going to the uh, California Library Association conference, and we do these things to keep up to date and to make sure that we can bring we can get ideas for for cool programs and initiatives. We can keep up to date with what other libraries are doing. There is there is real benefit to having that exchange of information. And a little bit more locally, so along those lines, uh, at, at the Bellevue Library, there's tons of the makers space, and I have the pleasure of visiting South San Francisco and visiting their maker space and speaking with one of their librarians, with uh, the colleague, uh, a colleague, fellow librarian. So we can see what type of materials and equipment to buy and check out some of their programs and see that ideas for our own library. We also have been reached out to by Atherton Library and they're interested in doing some collaboration with schools that we both serve in other parts of the area. Yeah. That's great. I, I don't I don't want to keep you too long, but if anybody has other questions, we're we're at your disposal. And the team will also be back. Maybe not these four exactly for the for the further discussion throughout the year, but John will certainly be back for the programming discussion in November. We'll dive a little more deeply into some of these topics. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry to keep you guys no, standing. Um, I was just curious that you mentioned at the beginning about like a modular training program. I was curious if you could expand a little bit on what that actually means. <laughs> so. Anyone who is hired is expected to be able to work all of our service points and to work what we call the back end. That is basically getting stuff from where it is to where it needs to be, uh, whether that is getting things from shelf and putting it on the whole shelf or uh, putting it in the shipment to another Peninsula Library System library, or whether it's taking in shipment and reshelving those items, reshelving the things that are returned in our book drop. That's that's the sort of work that might be done at a lower classification level in some libraries. We don't hire those classifications. Everyone who is hired is expected to be able to do that work. And that, in, 
Nick's out there shelving sometimes when he gets a little too much screen time. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> too many staff reports. I've seen Nora screen. at it too. Uh, so, you know, uh, that, that is work that's largely done by our hourly staff, but everyone is trained to do those things. When I say modular, I mean, we start them with the back end training. Well, we, just, we start them with an orientation to what, what is working in the library. And and we have a we have a back end training module. We have a help desk training module. We have a, a well, we have an accounts training module. We have a help desk training module. We have a children's desk training module. We I have a training team, uh, which is most of the benefit at staff at this point. Um, and uh, they are they all function as trainers for our hourly staff to make sure that the quality of service is maintained. Thank you. Any all right. Questions? Well, thank you all so much thank for you. being here and for this fabulous presentation. We're, I mean, so grateful for everything you guys do. It's amazing. Thank so, you. It's right a pleasure. Well, and you know, you. we're we're always happy to talk about our work. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you all we're for being here. Thank you. Yay! Thank, thank you. you. Okay, so turning to regular business with item E1, approving the minutes from the August 19th, 2024 meeting. Nick, do we have any public comment on this item? This time, if you'd like to make a public comment on item E1, approving the meeting minutes from the August 19th, 2024 meeting, please use that raise hand function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Press star nine if you're phoning in or fill out a comment card and bring it forward if you're here in person. Seeing no hands raised, you can proceed. All right. Um, would a commissioner like to make a motion to approve the minutes? I'll move to approve. Thank you. Do I have a second? Okay, second. great. Thank you, Kim. All right. All right. We have a motion on the floor by Commissioner Westcott, seconded by Commissioner Crockett to approve the minutes from the August 19th meeting. I'll do a roll call vote. Commissioner Crockett, how do you vote? Yes. Commissioner Herrick, how do you vote? Yes. Commissioner Pollock, how do you vote? Yes. Commissioner <clears throat> Schaefer, how do you vote? Yes. Commissioner Westcott, how do you vote? Yes. And Vice Chair Wise, how do you vote? Yes. Motion passes unanimously with mm -hmm. Chair Orton absent. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so next we have item E2, a report out from the ad hoc subcommittee consisting of Commissioners Crockett, Herrick, and Westcott. Uh, Nick, do we have any public comment on this item? It's time if you'd like to make a comment on item E2, the ad hoc subcommittee update, uh, please use that raise hand function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Just press star nine if you are dialing in. Pull out a comment card and bring it forward if you are here in person. Pausing for effect, but seeing no comment. <laughs> Back to you, Vice Chair. Okay, so we're just going to open it for discussion to the subcommittee members. You guys have a report out, or okay? Um, do you want me to? I'll, I'll update on we met. And... Yes, okay, that sounds so, great. So the ad hoc committee met on August twenty eighth. Um, we're getting started. We looked at what we have to do, the tasks, and so more. We're really right now putting structure on on the process. Um, we talked about some things like benchmarking to other library, libraries that are equivalent. We decide we everyone needs to learn more about the uh, star system, the ranking and where we stand and what goes into improving that. Um, we, we'd like to also uh, start outlining focus groups for different constituents in the area to get mm -hmm. an understanding of what they, how they look at the library, what they would need, you know, how often they come to visit and what would motivate them to use the library more. Mm -hmm. So I think the committee will meet again before the October meeting. And I think in October, we try to present this approach going forward. And I, I would think even starting to get the other thing we discussed is getting the whole commission involved in assigned different tasks that they would do individually and report back to the full committee. 
mm -hmm. whole commission. So. Sounds good to me. Anything else? Yeah. Yeah. And sort of second, what Brian said about, I think to be successful. This we sort of originally talked about this project, like back in the July meeting that we'd, we'd come up with a structure, but I think everyone would probably find their niche and, and volunteer if possible. Because I don't mm -hmm. see this type of work getting done over new focus groups and everything yeah. else. It's just two or three people. You right. Know, should be sure. Yeah. The other thing that I think is important is in this report that I think um, we had a fair amount of discussion about the timeline and Brian, yes. I think he's in business yeah. or I don't know, but he's pretty aggressive and thinks we can get things done. And we know <laughs> is coming in with this plan to really finish the staff sort of reporting process process of this year when they sort of explain there at the final things that we envisioned for the library of the future in July. And so I think we talked about, even though we'd love to be done by June, because I think Carol, Carol hasn't been part of this discussion, but I think she yeah. wants to sort of own this, get it done by the time she's done with it being chair, but it might be a little more realistic if you talked about August, September, October to really create a report that's from the voice of the commission, mm -hmm. simply because if we dump, <laughs> we do all this work, we drop it on Rose and Nick <laughs> in July yeah. and have them run with it, then it, it, I think it sort of um, flips things on its head a little bit. Whereas I think we should be incorporating everything we heard from library staff in order to report to the council as sort of the role of the library commission. Yeah. And so that's just one thing we haven't figured out. Yeah. <laughs> that we should raise. I, yeah, I would add lot. on a, a part of that, just like you said, is sort of reviewing um, the previous city studies and the whole mm -hmm. um, process and timeline and the steps taken, assessments, public comment, city council reports and staff reports about um, the library improvement project systems project mm -hmm. um, started in 2017, I guess, and all the way through um, and kind of paused on the main library aspect of it in 2019 or, or thereabouts. Mm -hmm. um, so we just need to review all of that so we're not duplicative in a lot of the work that we're trying to accomplish right now and maybe be super efficient and leverage all of the great work that has already happened so we're trying to figure that out actually i wonder if that's one thing which nick shared with at least the three of us that material that was sort of he actually compiled it in a very helpful way yeah. where he went over like sort of that i think a half decade worth of Oh documentation gosh. that's in the public <laughs> record but in order to actually read it you need nick to compile it for you which he's done i sort of think if commissioners had time to sort of at least skim through that in our before the October meeting, it might make for the most fruitful sort of full discussion. commission discussion. Because I think, Commissioner Pollock, you've, I think, a couple of times over the last few months when you've been discussing this, noting that, I mean, that was really focused on a building project. And I, I don't want our process this year to start with a building project. I think it's really important that we start with vision. You know, and maybe it does lead to, oh, Menlo Park needs this, that, and the other. But I think it's really important that we don't let, oh, we need to do a building project <laughs> to drive the process we're engaged in this year. And mm -hmm. so I think, and, and there are aspects of what Nick shared out and delved into it, which sort of show that that methodology that happened over the course of maybe, I think, 2012 through 20 something. Um, and so I think that'd be really helpful for October. We all just kind of right on mm -hmm. the same page, at least we're sort of reviewing materials for that. Right? Is that something you'd be able to share, or is that? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I've already done the work. I just stopped it. We pressed the button. Send again. Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> for, for, is it like on a FTP drive or no? Mostly, it's links or? to staff reports that were already mm -hmm. uh, already exist. They're on the city's website. It's just knowing the dates, so you don't mm -hmm. have to sift through all of them mm -hmm. to find out. And then I think I put some kind of connective tissue there in my email text, sort of talking about how things happen and somewhat why they happen. Not, and not Nick, I think you gave a really good overview to understand the broad picture over the timeline. Yeah. So I'm happy to send that out to the full commission too. Great, thank you. Well, thank you all for meeting and doing that. It's very exciting. I think to have a nice vision moving forward. So I'm looking forward to October. Um, can, oh, yeah. Questions? Uh, so, sorry, I, I sound maybe like a broken record or um, annoying, but I, what I'm looking to hear is like sort of um, 
the the subcommittee has gotten together and our proposal for just like a, a vision statement or what's what what is it that you are attempting looking at considering accomplishing and it's like okay yes library of the future maybe it's physical maybe it's not but sort of I don't know, like a, 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 a vision statement or a objective right. statement of this is what we are looking to accomplish in this time frame in this way. And then that's the sort of the outline or the overall framing. And then that's brought back to the larger commission. And then we say, yeah, OK, right. uh, I think you guys are good to go. Yeah, because we may I comment on it? Yeah, because oh, this this ad hoc committee, if I remember correctly, is only like a two month. The first stage is a two month committee. So our charter was come up with a process, which would include how we would do it, not necessarily the content, and that's what we have slated for October. Is okay, so I'm process. confused. Like, so process. Okay. Of right. how we're gonna do what. That's what is it? That, that we're that, gonna, how we're going to get to a point where we define what the library of the future is from a functional need standpoint by after July of next year. Now, the schedule is probably more like <laughs> September, we think, because that's what followed this year is, you know, a presentation to the council mm -hmm. that would combine what the librarians are putting together and the activity. So it will include, you know, some kind of a goal for the committee, the process, the inputs, and we even to the point where maybe in October we can, we agree we can start uh, taking different responsibilities for different texts. Yeah, and I'll highlight here for you, um, mm -hmm. David, that um, I think this is a vision for the Menlo Park Library future. I mean, right, obviously right. it's informed by, right? And I think a yeah. really important thing that we we uh, sort of put in the bullet points here in terms of activities is convene focus, convene focus groups of Menlo Park residents to gain insight to their needs and perceptions. Because I think Nick has noted that yes, people come into the library and give comment and public feedback. Mm -hmm. The library staff don't actually have the time to to actually form focus groups, especially of people who don't come to the library, right? right? Mm -hmm. or, or or targeted focus groups of what services are we not meeting? And I didn't want to you know, put Rose and the rest of the staff on the spot there, but there's a lot about, she alluded to this in the public library history, not all public libraries have been so public throughout history, mm -hmm. and especially more recently. And so I think, especially in Menlo Park, we have a fairly homogenous community. We also have a very diverse community. So like, are there populations we're just not serving and library staff don't know yet? I think that would be a really important thing that we're, if we can, discover this year. So that's an example. Sure, maybe two or three people could run all the focus groups, but we would actually invite more of our fellow commissioners if they would like to get involved to engage in that type of activity. Um, and so that's really what the what the vision statement or end product that Carol, I think, is going to guide us in by next summer sometime. Yeah, we don't know yet, but I think it's to make some sort of statement from this commission that we've thought about long-term strategy, which is one of our key functions as, as a commission. Okay, because I, when I, yeah, maybe I, I'm still not getting, but getting like, before we talk about a process of like, for example, uh, focus, getting, convening focus groups or talking with other libraries, what is like the one or two sentences objective of the subcommittee mm -hmm. of beyond okay defining the library of the future but which uh, what, what combination of uh services and programs beyond the current plans and trajectory uh that is inclusive of the um you know of our diverse communities and you know better you know supports the needs of those uh groups in town because right. if if there wasn't a 
uh, an effort to do what you're doing, it sounds like generally the, the library itself is doing its long-term planning and it, it's, it's, it's uh, talking best practices with other libraries. It's, um, it's convening um, uh, community focus groups, it's getting feedback from the community already, but we're going the extra mile to do something further into the future. Uh, and I'm, I'm just not clear what that Okay. Yeah, I think my, at least my understanding was the work plan for this commission, like the work plan goals that we, at the last mm -hmm. meeting, we, mm -hmm. uh, the work plan to review library programs and services, identify poten potential service gaps for specific age groups mm -hmm. or affinity groups and advise to fill needs to create the library of the future. Mm -hmm. My understanding was like this ad hoc subcommittee was mm -hmm. kind of our attempt to fulfilling the work plan goal too. Okay. <laughs> that, well, yeah. What you're talking that, about, David, is what we're going to present in October. It was like, yeah, how that, are we going to, how are we going to attack work right. goal, like the work very, plan goal too? Yeah. How are we going okay. to attack the work of reviewing these plans and identifying service gaps and mm -hmm. where are the mm -hmm. missing needs and things like that? So coming up with a methodology for that was... Mm -hmm. So, right? Yeah. My yeah, understanding I mean, of how we, and then then these these bullet points are. Mm -hmm. But I hear you saying, why should we engage in this work at all? Because Rose is going to do it anyway. I mean, I, I, it's sort of boiled well, down that, to yeah, that. Well, right? I, 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 no, <laughs> I don't mean it as a diplomatic or not diplomatic thing, but what, 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 what's the delta that we're providing beyond what they're doing yeah. anyway? And are we... Uh, I mean, there's nothing wrong with using the word, you know, more visionary and more long-term, um, you know, uh, uh, as, you know, more aspirational than just what's happening over the next year. Right. And so sort of putting a little bit more of a structure on what, what does that aspiration look like? Because it could be you know, literally, the, you know, the sky's the limit of uh, we could research everything and anything uh, to do with anything to just to make that plan. Um, but we're focused, we're going to end up focusing on, on, on rolling up our sleeves on A, B, and C because we have a overall objective of kind of we're we're trying to build out this like you know five year you know strategic vision for the library and going going back and doing these specific tasks contributes to that right yeah and we've talked with the library committee and we're going to do this collaboratively so but they mm -hmm. are not going to they are some of the activities they'll be doing some they don't have the resources to do on this process. So it's a strategic planning mm -hmm. process and there mm -hmm. are activities and tasks that'll get us to the end point. And it's, it's, as Kim said, it's part of that process is determining where we stand now, where Menlo Park Library stands now, mm -hmm. a, defining a vision for the future that, you know, being, I. Five, 10 years. I'm not, I don't think we've established that yet. And then looking at the barriers and also at some point, you know, factoring in the budget and how much money we have. So we put this all together and say, you know, these are some practical uh, steps. You know, mm -hmm. you could go to A and it'll maybe be about this much, or you go to B and, you know, different people might mm -hmm. have different opinions. But the ad hoc committee right now for October is going to try to put together that overall structure mm -hmm. and identify the tasks, but we're not going to accomplish any of the actual tasks. No, I'm not, but I'm, I don't, I, maybe I'm, I'm, but the, the, the thoughts that in my, are in my head are not, I'm not expressing it well, but uh, before we talk about any task or any activity 
it seems that we have to have a clear consensus on what is the 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 objective of mm -hmm. the um uh, of the effort of the plan well i think and before then and we can then back into what are the individual tasks or responsibilities that are needed to get to that if i if i could mm -hmm. um uh, just uh, the library commission did establish a written scope of work for the ad hoc subcommittees so maybe some of mm -hmm. the question, your questions are answered there and it's up there at the top thank you nick for putting it on the screen scope of work that bullet point identify by october a methodology so the first thing is you're doing a methodology okay okay the approach and i think mm -hmm. it's been said a few times um and then it's focused on work plan goal number two Mm -hmm. and which is to review the program and the services. And then I think key, you're asking, what is the task? What are they doing? Is to identify potential service gap gaps. And okay. not only just gaps, but specifically mm -hmm. gaps around age groups and affinity groups. So I, th I think that is maybe mm -hmm. granular enough to kind of get a sense of like, this is sort of the deliverable that the mm -hmm. subcommittee is, is to be doing. And then along the way to also then, you know, give some recommendations to like fill those needs mm -hmm. it, with the goal of, you know, filling them in a way that contributes to the library of the future. So I think that's like narrow enough that okay. um, and I've heard that the committee got off to a good start and got some, some ideas flowing and you're feeling confident that you can come back with a, at least that methodology by October. And then what I think we were hearing in the report out is to actually implement those things will we'll take some what more time and of course the full commission would be involved in that if that's helpful. Yeah. And, and, and i could sum up that i do think you're getting to a bigger point i think <laughs> commissioner pollock about why and i would say why I mean, our whole point i think as a commission is mm -hmm. we just provide a community sort of sourced input and voice to the professional library staff who right. are running the services of the city and so i think right. we can look at our role this year to do in parallel what Rose is sort of doing, because she's kind of doing goal two as well, right? She's reviewing for all of us in front of us. <laughs> this is what our library services are now. We think about this, that, and the other. She's gonna be presenting right. this throughout the year. She's gonna get to a library the vision presentation, I think, in July. So we're doing a very parallel process, but from a different perspective. So when you have two different perspectives in conversation and dialogue, you can mm -hmm. end up with a stronger product. So maybe that's a useful way to, to, to think of just that. Add to that the purpose, as I understand it, of this commission is as an advisory body to the city council, first mm -hmm. and foremost. And so part of the purpose of us doing this work is to create create something that will be presented to the city council to inform them mm -hmm. on what steps can be taken to help the library more so than to produce something directly for the library itself. Right. And so to some extent, there is a slightly right. different goal behind yeah. the work, even if the work overlaps somewhat. It, and I might add that we, mm -hmm. we've talked together and it's a combined goal. You know, we're going to collaborate. We're not just going to run these in yeah. parallel. Yeah. And yeah. I think that's an important We're going to say, yeah. well, if Point. you're doing that, we don't need to do Plus two equals we'll, six. Kind and, of. Uh, and I think Kim, you know, found in the reports, and I think we said this, we're really resurrecting a process that had started five, seven years ago. Mm -hmm. And the council had actually maybe uh, voted on this. So I think part of this is resurrecting the work that had been started in the first Bellhaven came first, which is great. And, mm -hmm. you know, but there's been a need, obviously, in the community for a long time. To at least look. And mm -hmm. so now we have a chance to possibly in Prove the understanding of the needs at this point in time. And uh, and I, I think it's going to be a living. You know, we're not trying mm -hmm. to define the, the library of the future now. That's the goal is to get all this information and say, what what should that be for Menlo Park? Mm -hmm. Right? So, because that's one of the reasons I was interested in the social services, because mm -hmm. I, 
you know, I'm not sure librarians have been trained in that or it's just something <laughs> I take on. I was asking to ask directly about burnout because with public librarians, she mentioned the Tenderloin in certain mm -hmm. urban areas in the United States. I mean, burnout among public librarians is just huge. And I don't, Nick, you, can, you don't have to fess <laughs> off, but I, I don't get the feeling that's here now, but, you know, Menlo Park likes to be ahead of the curve. And so I think that's just for something for us to grapple with. <laughs> I mean, we all get burned out of jobs. And, <laughs> Excessive social services <laughs> to make them burn public, <laughs> ravaging public libraries. <laughs> so I might add. So hopefully, what we what we mm -hmm. bring in October is a draft. It's to be thought mm -hmm. of as a draft, a starting right. point for everybody to add to. It's not locked in concrete. I don't think at that point. No, uh, but I, and I appreciate what you Good evening, said about closing um, in twenty minutes. If you have anything you'd like to check out, please bring it to the front now. Restrooms will be closed in ten minutes. Is sort of and I, maybe I'm sounding too uh, aspirational, but what you just said about the original goal of the commission as an advisory body to city council, it was established for particular reasons that they wanted the group to right. advise because there was a, a gap in that. And then uh, over the years, it may be kind of, um, you know, each commission not knocking any, you know, older, you know, uh, previous commission members, but it was what everyone made it to be in the moment and getting back to the, I don't know, the roots or the, you know, original um, uh, aspirations for the commission is, I'm, makes me more excited. Yeah. And I think makes, and, you know, I'm, I'm thinking also about selling the, the final product to city council uh, and the more it connects, you know, to that, um, to the backstory and brings it, you know, to the present will help us sell it right that much further so uh, thank you for that clarification it'll be a lot of work yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but we want everybody to be part of it. well just on the on the point of it's a lot of work and we're all busy <laughs> but if in my experience um uh in the work that I've done over the years and like kind of community organizing, the the this the more specific you can be on this is a task that I'm mm -hmm. handing to you. It's all, you know, neatly, you know, packaged in this way. I need you to, you know, to work on this task is a lot easier for me to right. uh, contribute a lot than like, oh, hey, we have this whole section and kind of, you know, fill it out, you know, however you want is it's harder to get right. people to, to buy in and, and do the work. Any other comments? Okay, we'll Otherwise, we'll just look forward to the report out in October. <laughs> <laughs> okay, perfect. Um, all right, so on item E3, we have an update on Library Commission informal liaison assignments. Um, so, Nick, you're going to provide a brief introduction. Really quick. Um, <laughs> the commission had made some um, of these informational liaison assignments back in July. Is that correct? What did I write in the so. July. <laughs> July. Um, and then there's been some discussion with the um, ad hoc subcommittee and some other discussions that I heard. I just wanted to know if the commission wanted to look at those assignments, change them if they wanted to change them, or just sort of give the opportunity to like um, Commissioner Crockett had expressed some some interest in um, perhaps being an informational liaison with the friends of the library. So rather than just letting you can just kind of scatter off to think, to bring it back to the commission and go, hey, is this okay? Does somebody want to say, hey, I'd like to do this and to have the whole commission have a chance to talk about it? I, 
I didn't know that the assignments were formal to begin with, or um, they're not. Or do they change? Do they? <laughs> they are <laughs> not that... formal at all. I mean, it's it's not like it's a a duty of the library commission to formally assign an informational liaison to this and that and the other group. It's just something mm -hmm. that the commission has done in the past. But uh, if someone said, oh, hey, I'd like to be the uh, liaison to the friends at the library, if they mention it at a commission meeting and decide to end up like dropping the ball, uh, is it, it doesn't seem like is that do they need to like announce that they're I mean I think the know, idea and, is that it's it's just coordinated right so if there is yeah. like a you know someone serving as a liaison that okay everyone knows who that liaison is mm -hmm. there are like three different commissioners kind of serving the same function or mm -hmm. to your point that there isn't something like left behind like so for mm -hmm. example the friends of the library are pretty significant group to the library. Mm -hmm. So if there are to be informational liaisons, it stands to reason that certainly there should be a liaison to that group. So just making sure right. that, okay. you know, it's not missed because there wasn't coordination. Okay. Yeah. So, but I can fill you in on, I think, why this agenda is on here, because in, in June, like you, David, I said, but I think <laughs> you actually mentioned maybe getting in touch with potentially Public school systems, if it's related and everything else, yeah. went back to the meeting. I actually made a commitment to just reach out to Nick about both the Friends of the Library and, and the and its own mm -hmm. library system. Just to reach out to Nick, because Nick had been ambivalent when he gave me this library <laughs> tour about two things. <laughs> and so I um I only actually was able to speak with Nick about it when Kim was there in the meeting. It was on August 28th. We combined a lot of things in the same day. Mm -hmm. And so my reaching out to Nick to find out about that, I um, was like, well. If Kim would like to be the Friends of the Library person, then I will um, continue mm -hmm. to try to focus on the Peninsula Library System, which is not an affinity group, but it's an informational liaison type activity, which I think is important um, for us to get our handle, our heads around and handle. Mm -hmm. it's, it's such a big part of our, I haven't looked at the budget, but I'm assuming it's mm -hmm. a big part of our budget and their aspects to the right relationship, which is just a little bit tricky. And we don't really have a role mm -hmm. necessarily to go directly to them in many ways. But to that point, there is almost no community engagement or input. It's all run basically by a staff. Um, and it's sort of a cooperative a consortium based on vendors and all sorts of other relationships. Um, so I think that's why this whole item came up on the agenda um, this month, <laughs> is my sense. Because <laughs> I mentioned to Carol back in July, oh, I haven't gotten in touch with Nick yet. Do I need to report mm -hmm. the commission reports? She said, no, just wait till we have something to report. Um, so that was my intention today is to use the commissioner reports to do that. But if we think we need to do, because I think Carol thought I was the friends of the library person, even though I didn't think I necessarily had committed to that. But yeah, I think Kim, if we sort of get it all on record Wait, now, sorry, Kim I is just, like. I just raised my hand. Nick said, well, if you want to be, and I was like, I'd love to be. So then I, yeah. So if that's okay. <laughs> and then I took a tour yeah. of the Friends yeah. of the Library, and uh, it was very yeah, interesting. And so, uh, the, uh, part of the reason I'm 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 asking is like, oh, hey, if we need a liaison to the like school district, like I can do that. And then the uh, staff said, oh, well, we're already doing that. Oh, okay, well, I. Don't mean to step on any toes, but if it were helpful from a commission member to contribute to that process, I would do so. But if you know if that is already covered, then you know um, you know that's fine too. Uh, so that was the reason I asked about that. But then, like also, if I I was said, oh, hey, I could be liaison to the um, like bicycle, you know, community. There's a Silicon Valley uh, bicycle coalition and there's safe routes to school, you know, activities. And again, I don't know, if, you know, I'm like to help. I've been on, you know, calls together and but I don't know if that's like a, you know, formal 
you know, liaison kind of thing or just, you know, something that I'm doing personally. Well, back at that um, June meeting, I think uh, you were going to be the lia liaison to the safe routes to school. Yeah. Group. So okay. that is. Oh, okay. So formal that, in that yeah. sense. Okay. <laughs> And I've been doing that. <laughs> okay, thanks. Could I ask, maybe at the next meeting, we could list all the groups we feel we should liaison with and who's who's either doing those or if we have open slots. Well, I, I don't want to, by producing a list, I don't want to, I don't want you to feel compelled that you have mm -hmm. to assign an informational liaison to all of the groups. It's not required necessarily. If you think it would be helpful because the work being done with those groups could inform the work that the commission is doing then that's when i think the commission would look to assign mm -hmm. a, a commissioner to go and report back but I, I as as long as you don't take that as me saying oh you've got to have a liaison to all these 12 groups or something that's yeah. that's not the intention yeah and i think uh if i could just kind of jump in the in the past really the focus has been on library affinity groups which yeah. essentially so boils down 10 minutes. If you're working on a laptop, please start saving your work. It boils down to the Library Foundation and the right. Friends of the Library because those are two nonprofit groups that their sole mission is to support Menlo Park Library. Yeah. So, I mean, you could kind of go mm -hmm. further afield than that, but that's that's really was the okay. initial um, sort of impetus for it some years ago. Well, and I think if you go back and look at the April, there's an April conversation <laughs> at minute 37, and then that reference of this conversation in December, that April conversation where Vice Chair Singh was still here really goes into the fact that the pandemic, you know, stirred things up, shall we say. And he did make the comment there at some point that some of the commissioners who'd been on the commission before the pandemic had been multiple terms, I think, and they'd had these established, I don't want to say decade-long <laughs> relationships. So some of these things go back a generation, I would say. So I think that's one of the useful things about the pandemic and the fact that we're all so fresh and new. What does it, an informational ease on assignment mean now? And I think to your point, mm -hmm. <laughs> don't, don't think just inside the box. I mean, you have mm -hmm. to be careful, I think, in terms of informing, you know, everyone, you know, what's going on. But I think that's really helpful to sort of think about the fact that there's formal informational affinity groups that are traditional and they sort of like Carol is on the foundation board now <laughs> because they want a commission member on the board. Um, and the Friends of the Library, obviously, we always have contact with them as we should, and, you know, just show appreciation every year, if nothing <laughs> else, at least once. Um, but I do think it's, it's important that we, when we think about a library of the future, think about what that is anymore. Is it mm -hmm. just people who have money to give to the library or time to volunteer to the library and that's all the library is, or are there other groups in the community we should be liaison with or you know, gathering information through channels that aren't just staff? Yeah, and another element to this that, um, <clears throat> you know, this is an opportunity just to mention it, especially if there's discussion of maybe branching out beyond what maybe one might think traditionally is a library affinity group. So not to pick on Commissioner Pollock, but <laughs> so a couple of things. One is it's important for the full commission to kind of have a discussion about that. <clears throat> what is the nature of the liaison ass assignment? What's the purpose? Is full commission aware of it, having discussed it? Also, um, it's an opportunity to, and we did attach the commission committee policies and procedures, roles and responsibilities, just as a mm -hmm. reminder to folks, especially because we do have new commissioners who maybe haven't had as much experience with um, like considerations around the Brown Act and some other things that do kind of govern, you know, the, the role of a commissioner as far as, you know, when interacting, um, you know, in on library business, I guess, you know, out there in the community important to make like the distinction between, you know, kind of what our interests are as an individual versus what the full commission has kind of determined and as being like a, a stance or a, or a message from the full commission and, and some of those other sort of elements that are all in the policy. So it just seems like an opportune time to kind of bring all that around. Um, it's really uh, wonderful that we have such an engaged uh, set of commissioners here who really want to go out there and do some additional sort of legwork which is fantastic. We just want to kind of set everybody up to be like really <laughs> successful on that. I don't think we need a motion or do we? 
So yeah, I don't know if, yeah. <laughs> if we need like a with my working with the Palenza library system in whatever way I can find, do we need a, 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 a an affirmation of that? I mean, went back and looked at the June <laughs> meeting and everybody was hot nodding their heads like, yes, yes, <laughs> we need we need people to be looking into that. So is that are people comfortable with my continuing to do that since I'm not really yeah. friends? Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know that it will come to much just because I'm not sure that that there's a structure in this county for us mm -hmm. to be able to communicate in that way. But as long as you are comfortable that I continue to to try to find some some structure, I'll do that. I, I, to Sean's point, I think if as long as we continue to say, hey, I'm I'd like to reach out to this organization and I'm sharing it with the Larger the commission is, closing, is everyone okay with that? Course, the library opens and then again, that's kind of the end of that. Well, I mean, just like I said, oh, hey, I can reach out. Like, oh, I I checked into something for Nick about the makerspace with um with Tide Academy, and it's like, oh, I enjoy doing this kind of thing. I can do more of it if it's if it's uh, helpful and. I was kind of informed. You know, no, it's not really. There's not a lot of um, other things, you know, that are need any um, a lot of help with right now. Um, so I think just like bringing up, like, oh, hey, I I have connections, or I can, um, you know, communicate with this organization or that, and just bring it to the larger commission or run it by um you know staff that's probably does that meet the you know i think the best mm -hmm. bet is for any like that's why there is a section in the agenda which is um commissioner reports you know that's mm -hmm. just that's yeah. the opportunity okay. you know yeah. certainly encourage commissioners to just avail themselves hey i was out and about i had this or that mm -hmm. conversation i learned this or that thing i made this or that connection um that's that's really the whole that, that that's where the real benefit is because then everyone gets to kind of hear and benefit from you know the the learning. Just a note um, that um, compared to like conversations I've had with like folks on Park and, Parks and Recs Commission, I know there's been a lot of um, uh, vacancies on on that commission and 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 such over time. But uh, you can be really proud that you have a such an enthusiastic library commission at your disposal. Oh, sure. Really appreciate it. <laughs> an enthusiastic library commission. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely appreciate it. Thank you. But not if we go to 8 30. Then you won't appreciate us anymore. <laughs> Enthusiasm has a place. Yeah. And it's 8 30. This is nothing. Going. I was going to say, you guys are used to much longer yeah. meetings. Yeah. You've never been to a city council <laughs> meeting where they're talking about, like, you know, anything. <laughs> Um, anyway, I'm sorry. I I neglected to prompt you to call for public comment on this. Oh, right. oh. So yeah. I should do that now. So the conversation is winding down. So at this time, if anyone would like to make a public comment on on this item, uh, please use that raise hand function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. This is item E3, update on library commission informational liaison assignments. Star nine if you're dialing in, comment card in the back there if you're here in person. So no commenters here in person or online. I think we're okay. Okay. All right, so moving on to item F, um, informational items are transmitted to the Library Commission in staff's effort to provide an update on matters of importance to the commission. Informational items are not action items. However, a commissioner, city staff member or a member of the public may request to make a comment or ask a question on any of the informational items. So Nick will provide a brief introduction. Yeah, uh, through the chair, I might just call for public comment oh, on yes. the three informational items and oh, then okay. that way we could get that out of the way and then go on to the Sounds introduction good. and questions if there are any. So if any member of the public would like to make a public comment on item F1, the Library and Community Services Department updates, 
Item F2, the update on the city run child care programs. For item F3, the library commission tentative agenda calendar. Please use that raise hand function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Press star nine if you're dialing in. <laughs> Grab the comment card and fill it out and bring it up to me if you are here in person. Again, that's public comment on items F1, F2, and F3. Do we have any online participants? We do not have any mm -hmm. online participants right now. And yet I am compelled to call for public support. <laughs> Seeing no comment, uh, back, back to you, Vice Chair. Oh, I'm sorry. You're yeah, taking, like, it back to me. taking it back so, to you. <laughs> so the, um, uh, happy to provide these um, departmental updates. Um, there's a, our statistics in there, which we gather every month. Um, we are getting to where we now uh, have about a year's worth of them. And so we're starting to see some year over year information. We're also seeing uh, a few months of information on the library services at uh, the community campus. So that's interesting to see how that picture is going. We'll be keeping an eye on it. And I urge you just to sort of cast an eye over those statistics every once in a while. If you see something that makes you go, hey, hmm, then just uh, let us know. We're happy to comment on it. Um, included in the department updates was a report out, a final report out on summer reading, which was very successful this year, um, especially and interestingly with uh, groups that we haven't had a lot of success with in the past, and that is teens and adult participants mm -hmm. uh, in summer reading. So we're still uh, doing really well with the kids, but we were <laughs> able to pull in some teen participants and some um, a, a good number of adult participants in summer reading mm -hmm. uh, this year. Um, moving on to F2, the update on the city-run child care programs. So this item went up to the city council, had a study session on September 10th. Um, council directed us to go and do that survey of um, families who have uh, children who are of child care age who might take um, advantage of those services. Um, we are using essentially the same survey that the county office of education did mm -hmm. um, a couple of years ago because we wanted to, uh, we, we thought it was a, a pretty good survey, uh, simple, but also had a lot of good information. It's just that there weren't enough Menlo Park family participants to really tell us anything about what we should be providing or what they would like us to provide in child care services. We're kind of trying to guide, um, find a path forward for what uh, child care services in the city are going to be. They've, they've certainly changed since the pandemic, since the introduction of free transitional kindergarten services from the public schools, but we don't quite know what they're going to be yet. So that's what that process is about. That survey is out in the field right hmm. now. And then- Before you move on oh. that, I'll just add that the survey is out now. So this is like childcare needs, right? Asking parents mm -hmm. what they need. And um, we are tentatively planning to bring preliminary survey results to the library commission next month. Mm -hmm. So that's October mm -hmm. 21st. And uh, so we might have a little bit more of a conversation at that point in time. We'd love to get some um, thoughts from the library commission on that. And then the city council will review the results um, tentatively November 12th. So how is it going into the field? It's in the field. <laughs> it's in the, in the field. Right now, it's, it's basically gone out through our e-newsletters, through the, um, the sort of blooms uh, notifications are supposed to go out this week to app for child care it, families. It's for uh, communicating with classrooms and teachers and families uh, blooms uh, this week, and then the paper survey coming end of this week, early next week. Um, the consultant group is then going to begin having some focus groups, uh, both with the staff of the child care centers and with um, families. Um, to sort of talk about the issues in kind of uh, and smaller groups that, that give you a little more shading than just the results of the survey. The consultant group, is that the, uh, is that Eric Burmeister? Yes. Group, the solution right, group. Solutionary Advisors is okay. the name of the, okay. of the consultant team. Uh, and beyond Mr. Burmeister, who has a, a lot of local 
um, experience in education. The, the, mm -hmm. the other members of the team have a lot of um, experience locally um, in the school system in the Ravenswood district, in East Palo Alto, mm -hmm. uh, in the Bell Haven University. That's great. Hoping to get some really good results from those surveys. So the paper survey is being sent to, and how do you identify homes that have children of the age of zero to 12, I saw in the city council report? Yeah, we've got a couple of ways of doing that. One is we can look at our library user database and see who has children of that age registered. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we also have the recreation database just to see who are Menlo Park residents with kids registered in classes. Mm -hmm. um, and so could direct it that way. I don't think we're going to be doing a general mail out to all city. Well, probably not. The paper would be available for folks who prefer that format. Um, we also are working directly with the school districts to transmit through their channels, and they said, don't mm -hmm. give us paper. So oh, they, yeah. they, they go electronic too, oh, but wow. um, we do want to have a few. We typically um, have paper copies of surveys available. Generally mm -hmm. speaking, a single digit percent of mm -hmm. responses come come that way. We're grateful for them. Um, last survey we did um, that had about 1,100 responses. I think we got 90 responses on paper. So, you know, it's an appreciable number. So we're worth printing them. But you will go through the school district because I was hearing mm -hmm. how yes. it's going to reach the people who aren't already, <laughs> yeah. already aware of yes. the city of Menlo so, Park. So, so yeah, the nice thing about working with solutionary advisors is Mr. Burmeister used to be the district superintendent for Menlo Park Schools. So he has connections with the current Menlo Park Schools and school district, but also with other organizations that provide care, including child care providers. Um, so they, they're looking at other child care providers and, and sort of what the challenges are for those providers in Menlo Park. So hopefully this report, when we get it, will have some really good information, not just for the city of Menlo Park, but for all of the other child care providers in the city. Have you thought of going, I don't know, this might get a little bit too across the creek, but um, there are an awful lot of people at Stanford <laughs> can't get into that system who may live in Menlo Park. And if mm. they don't live in Menlo Park, that's a very large population. Um, I came out of that population. I didn't know Menlo. I've been living in Menlo Park for a year and a half and mm -hmm. I stayed at Stanford like a year longer than I wanted to because I didn't know that there was <laughs> care here. So I, I don't know if mm -hmm. that's it's possible to that's tap into great. that community in terms of the survey survey population. But sometimes, you know, you live in Menlo Park. If you're so Stanford oriented, you don't think about it. You don't right. have time to look at what's right there in your own backyard. No, there are a lot of people point. over, I think, in District yeah, 4, probably in these apartments who may well be wondering what they're going to do. Yeah, <laughs> good point. Good point. Mm -hmm. I'll bring I don't it know up. how you would tap into that. I'm sure they might have connections there already. So, yeah. and, and so that, that, uh, just that sort of what I'm curious about and not not to create more work for anyone, but any survey methodology is a, a challenge of how do you meet people where they are and get them to participate in the survey, like, a, you know, for elections and candidates, you know, it's like if you call everyone's like landline and, you know, or call them on their phone and they're not going to pick up, um, but do you send them a text? Do you, you know, meet them on the street? So uh, whatever that looks like. Intercepts, they call that. Meeting people on the streets for surveys is called intercepts. And yes, the, the, the consultant group is is planning on doing that, um, using some folks. They're even looking to hire some folks from the Bellhaven neighborhood to help get them out there at, okay. um, so they were at farmers markets and, and, and at the Ravenswood Health Clinic and other places where people might gather. Because yes, a lot of times, people would take a survey if they knew that there was a survey to take and they may not know right. that there's a survey to take. They don't look at those emails and, no. you know. And, and, and the other thing, people, people are about. busy and sometimes you need to yeah. see it yeah. two or three times before you're like, mm -hmm. hey, maybe I should do this. Mm -hmm. I think we're also giving out gift card, a gift card raffle. Or sorry, it's not a raffle. It's a drawing. It's a drawing. <laughs> it's a drawing for gift cards for those who complete the survey as a way to sort of incentivize um, that that's a suggestion that came from one of our one of our staff members at mm -hmm. the 
Bellhaven Child Development Center. Yes. That was a good idea. Yeah. And then moving, turning then to the agenda calendar. Um, here's the next couple of months. So I want to add, which I did just mention, because it just came up as the uh, child care preliminary survey results in October. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts about this? Things you would like to see added? We still have a few. Um, presentations uh, and topics unscheduled. I think we're gonna talk about the yearly calendar in November, which is timely though. Thanksgiving this year, is it the third Thursday? Is it the fourth Thursday? Is it 28th? Yeah. Very late. It's yeah, this, 20, so the last. It's the last yeah, the one. Last so we might day. wanna talk in October. Uh, we've, we've we have on our schedule the the commission meeting is the fourth Monday, which is the Monday was kind before. of curious. We did that last year though when they set the calendar. Right. And sure I we I might have been to avoid planning. conflict with the planning commission. It might be to avoid a it was planning, planning commission, commission conflict. Mm. That's the reason the library commission started adopting a calendar is because there's a conflict with the planning commission and we were mm -hmm. really bumped. We get mistaken. Bumped. So yeah, trying yeah. to get the calendar set. <laughs> a year out and that must be why it's on the fourth monday but we can take a, a little more in-depth look about that and come back to you guys and then a joint meeting which is more sort of an open house and social in december just because as yeah. rose likes to call it is cheese month and <laughs> and not a lot gets done necessarily in december so I've never heard cheese. I know I've Maybe never heard cheese, one, but cooking, I'm ready. I said, <laughs> yeah. Say no more. Also, time during which to eat cheese and forget what day it is. Yeah. 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 Most wonderful time of the year. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone got nostalgic and hungry at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm not hearing any other items that you think we should maybe pop in there. Go on to. Back mm -hmm. to the vice chair. Sounds good. So moving on to item G, would any commissioner like to make a short report out on items of interest to the entire commission? All right. Um, and if not, then this meeting is adjourned at 8.11 p.m. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, I was going to say we, we should probably get a few meetings in. Is okay. that does